Sunny 16 presents. Hello and welcome to episode 8 of The Lighting Lounge. My name is John Michael and I have the wonderful privilege tonight of being joined by Jake Hicks from uh, near England. Uh, How are you doing this evening? I'm good, I'm good, yeah, yeah. In fact, I'm so near England, I'm in England. You're in England. I wanted to say near London. (laughs) I know, Um, I know. I thought uh, that's what you were going to say, yeah. Yeah, this is just, uh, I'm I'm stereotyping myself as an American that, you know, London is England for America. That is very true, actually, yeah, yeah. When they just, everybody always assumes. London? Yes, okay, if it's easier, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you're you're near London, and you, you do you do your work in London, or...? Yeah, in and out. Yeah, so I mean, as anybody who lives in a ma- major city knows, it, it's um, yeah, it's 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 pretty pricey in the heart of it there. So I am outside, and if if I need to work in there, then you know, there's several studios and stuff that that I can hire that just makes it a little bit more economical to uh, do that. But yeah, so j- just outside, and I either do you know work work here at my place or just go in go into London and shoot. Yeah, you know? so it's pretty it's pretty easy to get in. <laughs> When, when women are not striking yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier <laughs> um so you've got you've got a studio at your place as well then it's like a home studio type type thing yeah so uh like model tests and that sort of stuff it's it's just it's just easier uh yeah, I, I am fairly involved when it comes to studio lighting so yeah it's just just cut like six lights and modifiers and umpteen lighting stands and everything else that comes with that it is i mean it's doable but it is a pain um so it's just just easier if i can just get one person to come here right so yeah, yeah you got everything set up and where it needs to be and exactly plugged in. Yeah, yeah yeah so it's yeah no big deal yeah 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 so for people that uh haven't heard of you or seen your stuff um mm. I, you're a, i guess a fashion photographer would be the best way to put it yeah, fashion editorial portraits, you know, uh, people, yeah, but um, certainly, certainly, I'd, I'd like to try and put myself towards the slightly more stylistic side of things, yeah. So it's not, it's not just a regular sat down on a wooden box with a painted backdrop behind you, turn it black and white, job done. So, I mean, no offense to anybody <laughs> who does that, of course, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so th- definitely more towards the sort of editorial side of of um portraits and fashion yeah okay yeah, yeah and I mean, I mean i've been looking at a lot of your stuff the last couple of days kind of preparing for this and you're you're definitely really your black and white stuff is really really great and i know you love using soft boxes for that so oh you that's have kind been of paying attention that's you kind have of the been things that attention. i've been paying attention yeah, to exactly. so yeah uh, people yeah. will furiously be googling jake hicks black and white now and i think i yeah. don't know soft will, box. will they yeah. find anything <laughs> be greeted by a lot of swearing <laughs> from 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 several articles from me but yeah other than that um it's yeah some yeah I, I, contrary to what many people think yeah it's very bright you know, colorful, um, bold. Yeah, I use use a lot of colored light in my work. Yeah, and in fact, pretty much all of my work is colored light in some way. Even when I, you know, have to do like an occasional daylight portrait, I'll play heavily with the Kelvin range and and sort of push the push the colors in it there. So uh, yeah, I'm really trying to trying to get away from just the the basic portrait as it were. Yeah. Yeah. So my my uh, flippancy aside, but you're you're really a master <laughs> of playing with color and adding color and um the more I look at your images, it's really, it's, it's just amazing to me because it's, it's almost like you're, you're painting with these colors and placing them so exactly. Um, what it's go on. Yeah, Sorry. Yeah. What, what, what attracts you to the color so much? Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a certain amount of masochistic tendency in there. Really? I, I mean, I, I would say that, um, you know, I know we're kind of joking about it here, and be, me being anti black and white, and I'm and I'm being very anti like oh normal basic portrait and that sort of stuff. But I suppose what drives me has been that 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 kind of need to try and do something different, trying to trying to um, create something different, like eye catching, right? You know, we see thousands of images a day, you know, and and, I, and I'm and I'm always trying to think about new ways to try and get people's attention when they skim through the the doom scrolling on, on Instagram. Like, how can we catch somebody's attention for just a fraction of a second longer? Um, and, you know, color 
years ago was was one way to do that and you know i think i think color gels are pretty ubiquitous now like they're everywhere you just see like you know everybody's using color gels and that's great it's amazing you know that's I, I, I love it but you got to think you know 10 15 years ago when i was when i was doing this uh, originally you know people thought i was fucking crazy you know <laughs> Uh, I remember people coming up to me and saying, you know, why have you, why have you turned her blue? Like, what's, what's, you know, what, 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 you know, that that was a beautiful image, and you know, until you ruined it with with those colors, um, you know, no, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not being hyperbolic. That's literally what what people would come up and say to me. So I think that you know, maybe when we see a colored gel shot now, we don't really think think too much about, oh, you know, Jake's using bright pink and bright blue on on that model. That's yeah, that's, that's cool, but. You know, it's it, it is a little bit out there from um, from 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 the norm, and that certainly got got some attention, and that's certainly how I've sort of made a name for myself in the um, recent years, for sure. Yeah. And um, you just you, did you just start by saying like, well, I've got some gels here in the corner. Let's see what happens with that. Or yeah, <clears throat> so I mean, it is just 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 a lead on from from what I was saying. Really, I used to work in a um, studio full full time and it's a very busy studio so I'm, I'm going back i don't know 2008 2010 i suppose when it was when it was kind of super super busy back then and you know that would be you know you were just a monkey with a camera back then you would just like you know you'd, you'd arrive and it'd be jake you're in studio two you're photographing a yoga book cover you know it's wednesday right jake you're in studio one you're photographing a family portrait you're doing a corporate headshot you know so you would just come in and you just you just you just be sent in and, and you know to, to to shoot what you needed to shoot as it were um and i don't know digital photography was kind of a bit of a buzz back then in terms of the public right so the studio was so busy like super busy it was nuts it would be doing like eight shoots on a saturday eight shoots on a sunday so and you i would shoot eight shoots on a saturday wow you know, eight shoots on a sunday and then another i don't know 10 15 during the week so um you know i have literally done thousands of different portrait shoots you know so it is like the studio was super super busy so people were coming in and you know I, for whatever reason the the economy at the time or whatever so and i i think we became pretty lazy in the studio in terms of just white background clients would come mm -hmm. in and go i want a white background you know headshot you know whatever sat down we would do that and they would leave we would take the money job done move on to the next client right um so it's just super boring it's like mind numbing soul crushing just to do that just for weeks months Eight sometimes shots a day seven days on a end, week right yeah i mean it's just and it just and it just just got to a point like i mean i'm either gonna you know you're either gonna um find me hanging from the high glide here or we or we gotta do something different mm. um so uh, you know, like a client would come in and and they would want the uh, white white background um, stuff, and I'd be like, yeah, I can I can definitely do that for you, you know, and I'd be able to maybe you, it's it's not difficult, right? I don't mm. care who says who tells you otherwise, but high key is not difficult. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, so you'd like knock that out in twenty minutes. You show the client and go, hey, you know, hey, you know, I've, I've done what 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 you're after. Are you happy with this? And they were like, oh yeah, that's perfect. That's exactly mm. what I wanted. And I'd be like, look, I've got you for another forty odd minutes mm. i've got this great idea that i think would be really cool that i could try with you you know i love what you're wearing what mm. your hair color is or whatever <laughs> just say whatever mm. it is just to please let me do something creative um so then i would then you know start start playing with colors and um you know in, in the studio and start doing something a little, little bit creative with them and from from there you know clients would come in asking for the high key white background stuff and then they'd be like oh that's cool i didn't realize you could do that mm. and they would and they would leave with you know something a bit more creative something a bit more colorful and then you know fast forward a little bit more time people would start coming in asking for the colored stuff right so you know i think i think us as photographers can be a little bit guilty sometimes of being a bit lazy you know i don't get it if the money's coming in like, why why um fix it but uh yeah just just from feeding the soul sort of thing I, I i i had to do something creative and that's really where the colorful thing came from it was like an anti high key sort of traditional fashion e editorial style look it was like i have to do something different and it just kind of grew from there so you've you've got um a really i mean i guess that developed over time too but you've got a really good um I guess mathematical or almost scientific knowledge of how these colors work together and um 
you know, combining your, you're dealing with additive colors rather than subtractive colors and how the light plays together and keeping your, your colors separate and that sort of thing. Um, so what, what are some of the challenges that people face when it's like, okay, I've got some lights, I've got some gels, let's just start banging color around. What are the, what are the pitfalls or what are the mistakes that, that often come up? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I, and I think that anybody who's played with colored light in the past has probably encountered, you know, some of the questions that you're you're asking there, like immediately, right? I, I, you know, like my colors are washed out or mm. Mm, they're not, you know, they seem a bit insipid or they're not, you know, they're not, I, don't, I thought I, I don't know how to get more saturation. Mm. Like, why aren't they as saturated as I thought? Like, um, and I, it, it is difficult, right? There is no shortcut to it. I'm not blowing my own trumpet here, but I've been doing it a long time. So people go, oh yeah, you know, color works amazing. It's like, yeah, I know. I've been doing it a long time though. You, you know, you, you, you can give me that credit, but I've been doing it a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so it is it, it is difficult. And I, and I do think that there are a lot of things to learn with colored lighting that I was just not aware of. Um, and, you know, I, I'd probably been shooting eight, nearly 10 years before I started to dig into um, color as much as I did. And I thought I was pretty damn good. I'll be honest here. Mm-hmm. I've been shooting in the studio. I've been, you know, doing hundreds of portraits, that sort of stuff. Yeah, whew, yeah I'm, I'm pretty good with um, studio lighting. Not even close. Like when you <laughs> when you start when you start adding color to that, it's it's a whole other ball game. Yeah, because if you've got four or five lights in a portrait setup, they're all the same color. Like mm-hmm. you can't go wrong, really. I mean, you, you know, you shine the, a bit of a hair light here, a bit of a fill light, a key light, got some background light, top light. Cool, right? You just turn them all on, boom, take the shot. You know, I mean, there are certainly bad bad versions of that, but they're all the same color. Mm-hmm. So you can overlap them to your heart's content and nobody's going to notice. Mm-hmm. Now, if you start doing that with colored lights, it doesn't, it just does not work. You cannot overlap colored lights. I mean, there are certain caveats to that, um, but yeah, that you have to keep colored lights separate. And the biggest reason for that is because colored light does not mix like we assume other colors mix, like when we're at school mixing paints. Yeah, they, you know, you, you're mixing your, you know, like, you, you know, all your paints together and, you, you know, you just keep mixing, 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 and you end up with that sort of like purpley brown color, right? That's what happens when you mix all your paints together. Um, now the absolute opposite of that happens when we mix colored light together, because the more colored lights you mix together, the whiter you get, not the, not the darker, right? Because colored light or, or a rainbow of color is white light. That's what a rainbow is. You know, when, when, when we, and we add all the colors together, we get white light. So when people are shooting with colored gels and they're putting the orange there and the blue there and then they're adding a bit of yellow here and that, like and they're overlapping they're not keeping those lights separate that's when they start to wash out and become it you know just no saturation to the mm. color at all yeah the more white it is the less saturation you have so you yeah or you get, other, or you get funky yeah. colors Yes, yes. So yes, so so there are certain colors that that will um, mix to create other colors, but it's but they don't those, those colors don't mix like like uh, like paint colors w- would mix. Yeah. Um. And in, in fact, there are certain complementary colors, for example, like orange and blue. Like you know, we see everywhere. You know, movies. You know, images that mm. sort of stuff. But if those two colors, if those two colored lights overlap, they kind of neutralize one another. So you get gray, which is what you know, which is where you see certain banding, like color mm. banding, happening in some in certain um, color gel shots. It's because people don't have complete control of those lights, and they're overlapping. Mm. So, the, like the biggest golden rule uh, of colored lighting is you can only apply a color to a shadow okay, okay. you know if you know if, if you're setting up your three gelled light setup you know turn off each light uh, you know and, and have just one light on shoot you know don't then think okay now i can lay another light around here no it's got to be you can only apply a color gel to a shadow hmm. um if you if, if not then you weird stuff is is, is going to happen either with the colors or it's just going to wash out and be totally ruined yeah yeah. Mm, cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, and uh, your your comment of you know you you can then see if your fill light is blue, you know, in comparison to just a a white fill and a white key light, the overlap you don't see, and then when you all of a sudden you've got a blue fill light, and it's like oh that's going all kinds of places I didn't want it to go. Yeah, yeah, and and so so <clears throat> I mean even if you decide not to not to take 
coloured lighting too far or you know like throw yourself into it like like I did I, I think that if you get even remotely even just a little bit good at colored lighting it will elevate your knowledge of light just th just through the roof because you know understanding light fall um you know light control being able to carve the light exactly where you need it is paramount with with a lot of colored gel shots and you know, when I was sh just shooting with white light, it was a mess. It was terrible. And, you know, I look back at some of those shots, it's just super lazy, you know. Um, and, you know, the face just becomes a little bit washed out and it just, just doesn't look good. So, mm. like I say, even if you, you know, e even if you decide not to use color in the future, and you, but um, like the knowledge that you can gain from um, shooting with colors can just elevate your white light game hugely, hugely. Yeah. Mm. So when when you're when you're preparing for a shoot or you've got an idea, what what's kind of going through your head? Do you do you plan out the colors you're going to use? Or are you just reacting to the situation? Um, walk me through that. Yeah, I think it's yeah. I mean, I think it's a f fair question, and I suppose everybody's different, really. I think that a lot of people assume that there is, you know, this regimented control and everything is, you know. You know, <laughs> you know exactly what, what, how everything's going to look, you know, beforehand and that sort of thing. And you know, for the most part, yes. Like I will, I will sketch out lighting diagrams and that sort of thing, and I will, I will have, I will try and get as much data as possible beforehand. Like if it's on a location, right? Mm. So we're just in, in a London nightclub or something like that. Or what color are the walls? Mm. You know, is the is the floor reflective? You know, is it black? Is it is it silvery? You know, mm. is is it super low ceilings? Is there matte black paint on the walls? Is mm. it silver on the wall? Like so you know it's not just about your subject but also knowing your environment. So I'm trying to get as much information about that as possible to um understand what's possible with the lighting. But then I need to undo understand also you know the model is she going to have long jet black hair is she going to mm. have you know like a tight afro is she going to have platinum blonde hair is her hair going to be off her face is it going to be covering her ears is it going to allow light to pass and hit her nose is it you know it's a, a, lot, a lot of things like that and then obviously the styling right mm. so are we, are we working with you know st structured um pvc or are we working with you know carbon fiber or is it going to be um i had like a copper plate outfit mm. once and you know all of these things not not only the color of the of the styling that you're using is going to affect my colored light you know because like, like i said you know colors will mix and there is a certain amount of color mixing that that happens um you know skin color will, will will have an effect i will use a certain type of blue on skin because i know that it looks better on skin than mm. a pure white background right so you know you you got to think about the like the, the colors that it's going to be falling onto as well as the texture you know and reflectiveness of the of the texture so like pvc and latex or something like that that is super shiny you need you know large huge modifiers to show this beautiful you know specular highlight um as opposed to like you know white cotton tea or something like that that, that doesn't mm. doesn't need that you can kind of fill it with with soft light and um work with it like that so there is there is a lot that goes into it in terms of prior knowledge in terms of planning a shoot right so understanding exactly what's what's coming up um trying to get a gauge of what the goal from the client is like what are you trying to do are you trying to show yourself off for like corporate mm. portraits nothing wrong with that um you know is this is, is is this the main focus or is the main focus the hair like we're doing a hair mm. shoot so do we need to focus on you know texture of the hair and, and, and shine on the hair or is it about the um styling do we mm. need to make sure that the styling is properly lit and showing um texture and depth and you know accurate color on that sort of thing as well um and then when we get on set, all that just goes out the, out the window. Right? <laughs> uh, so you know, it's it is experience, um, and I and I will say, you know, I, ha I have said before that you know most of our job really is problem solving, mm. um, because it's just it's just way too many variables when it when it when it comes to a shoot, and you would be ignorant to try and stick to your guns, try and stick mm. to your plan or your storyboard and that sort of thing as something unfolds on the day that, um, that that you hadn't thought of and it's not even about overcoming problems right it's about capitalizing on opportunities that you that, that, that you weren't aware of you know it was a shoot years back where it was in like this old 
um, I don't know, old sewing factory or something like that. And it was like, yeah, but I, I, we knew what it what it was and that sort of thing. But we got there and then there was all these really cool rustic mirrors and that sort of stuff. It's like, oh, that's nuts. Yeah, we have to try and use those in the shot, right? So everything just kind of goes out the window then. And you, you do kind of, kind of, you know, wing it to a certain extent to try and incorporate these elements that you hadn't been aware of beforehand. So I think there is, there is a lot, of um both your planning knowledge you know like i've just kind of explained being being aware of all these things but then also being open to the opportunities that are there on the day as well to really make the most of the shoot and that's really you know like the true um passion for me about being a creative is is, is really you know creating something on the fly like that is where you get you know a buzz for sure and everybody gets excited as well on the day you know because you really feel like you're all you're all making something then yeah you have a cool idea or you do something different and everybody's like, oh, yeah, this is looking really good. Let's, let's follow this path and see where it goes. Yeah, otherwise you're just painting by numbers, right? I mean, you may yeah. as well just type in prompts and spit out AI if that's what you want to do, right? I mean, well, then then you can go back to your studio and just do the cookie cutter again. You know, if you've got <laughs> exactly, everything so yeah. planned out, yeah. then then where's yeah. the creativity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah, And, and um, you know, everybody's different in terms of what they want to get out of it but for me yeah that's 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 definitely what drives drives me yeah yeah like that that problem solving and overcoming and you know there is certainly tons of shoots on my website that people go oh yeah check yeah i love that that's amazing yeah that's that, you know they're, like they're cool but there are certainly shoots that that i've done that i know that i've moved heaven and earth to overcome tons and tons of problems on the day to then still get something that's good and those shoots are like super like i'm super proud of those shoots you know but people don't know that yeah. so it is um there is a yeah there is certainly a lot of that um, i guess in a day it's just all about the end image and as long as the client's happy then cool but yeah yeah well and i mean it, no matter what our, our art form is there are things that we are more attracted to than others uh you know as you say based on the the amount of hurdles or the amount of challenges or what happened on the day or, you know, nice behind the scenes interaction. That's always, it's always fun to yeah. to look yeah, at the yeah. images. And then somebody who doesn't know all that stuff looks at him and goes like, yeah, it's a picture. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and I mean, more often than not, the client will throw in a curveball as well, mm -hmm. you know, that the, you haven't been anticipating and you know, all that, all that planning can be, can be shifted around. So I do think, I mean, you know, for, for, for the most part, most of us learn all learn all that on the job, and you just got to you know overcome it with a with a smile at the time. And um, uh, but yeah, I I think being being adaptable and flexible is is yeah just huge, especially on location shoots. It's mm -hmm. a little bit easier in a studio where you have control, especially your own studio. But um, no yeah, bit more what to expect there. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you know, I do. I do think that, you know, you see lighting diagrams in YouTube videos, you know, just the, the 10 minute, you know, tutorial on how to do a certain lighting setup. And it's just like, that's, I mean, it's just, it's just not telling you, it's not telling you anything really. Like you may as well just looked at a lighting diagram for what that's mm. taught you. Um, you know, that you, because it's so rare, you talk about the, you know, like the height of the model or, you know, the color of the hair or the reflectiveness of the, of the outfit and all this sort of thing. Like all, all this sort of stuff is the minutia that, that can really elevate so many images from yeah yeah it's cool to like wow you know and i think that that's that's where a lot of people are at the moment you know because i think that education now i mean when i i mean I'm, tw I'm going back what 25 years when i was you know learning you know that was back then on film and that sort of stuff where you had to learn le learn everything yourself and making mistakes yourself and i think that now you can you can buy a camera yourself and and be and be pretty good within six months like, that's mm -hmm. the reality of it you know um, so I think a lot of people are at that kind of that level where they're just like, how do I get, how do I get from this? Oh yeah, that's cool. You know, I can follow a couple of YouTube tutorials to like, how do I get my images to look like fashion editorial mm. ready? And and I think it's all those little bits of knowledge that, that, that aren't being, aren't being passed on at the moment, which, which I think is a shame. Yeah. Mm. So let's, let's take a step back and look at the, the big picture just for a second. Um, I think when, when you look at a studio image, you think, okay, that has been lit. There's lighting involved. And maybe when mm. you look at just a snapshot on the street, you think, okay, that is, you know, available light, natural light, whatever. So what would, what would be for you? There, there's, there's grades in between that. What would lighting, like I'm going to light an image. What does that entail? When is, when is it a lit image or a, or a available light image? 
that makes sense you mean like <clears throat> what are my sort of my sort of checklist of what makes a good studio lit image sort of thing not not a good one but just where is the where's the we started this podcast and we're calling it the lighting lounge okay. and you know i'm thinking for me it's clear a portrait is you know lit i'm adding light but um you know is adding a reflector out on the street is that also lighting you know is that where you know what is kind of the definition of lighting for you yeah yeah okay yeah i think I know what you mean, and I do think that. I mean, look, I've been a studio shooter for twenty years, and I'll I'll still be the first to admit that daylight is by far and away the best light that that there is. Um, and over the years, I've come to try and understand what makes daylight or you know sunlight as as impressive a light source as it is. And there's a huge amount of um, factors that go into that, you know. Uh, and then I try and bring some of those elements into the studio. And one of the things that I see people struggle with when they come from, you know, because it's it's unlikely, in all honesty, that somebody picks up a camera, goes out, buys a camera, and go boom, straight into studio lighting, straight off the bat. Like ninety nine percent of us start with available light, whether it be photographing flowers in the garden or going out on a walk and taking pictures in landscape, right? So we come from daylight, natural light, into the studio. Um, that's usually the, the like the, the path that most of us take, and one of the biggest kind of pitfalls that I think people make when doing that is that it is a jet black box until you do something to it, right? Because our eyes in the studio, we're walking around and we're seeing light, you know, even if it's, you know, minimal ambient light. But when you shoot that with a, you know, with a camera, it just goes jet black, like, like the background, for example. So for me, you know, lighting is looking at a clear definition between at its simplest form, a separation from subject to background, right? So, you know, we as uh, I image makers make three-dimensional versions seen in 2D. So, you know, how can we best do that? So I'm always looking at how can I make this look three-dimensional? So I need to separate the subject from the background, right? That's that's the baseline. I have to at least do that. And people, and, and people, you know, one, one of the one of the earliest mistakes that people make is not doing that. So the model isn't lit on one side, so it's like heavy shadow, and the background is jet black as well. So now we don't know where the model ends and the background begins. It's, it's like our eyes do not like that. Our mm. eyes are really bounce off these these jet black elements. Um, and you know any any half decent art teacher will um, tell you that you know blacks and whites don't exist in real life right in, in the natural world yes you can have something that's like maybe a shadow under a under a table but it's dark dark brown right it's not pure black or you know um a white t-shirt is not white you know it, it may it may have a hint of blue in the shadows and that sort of thing so you know you know thinking about having some data everywhere in in your image is paramount for me so that means that the background has to be lit even if it's dark gray it has to be lit um and then that that helps with that separation from the subject and then you know for me it's it's adding the three-dimensional light to the subject right so you got your key light and then like you said adding a reflector do we want do we want some some light under the chin? For me, yes, I do. I want some. I don't want it to be a pure a pure black shadow under there. Do I want some you know hair um, lights? Again, that's going to help me separate my subject from the background. So I'm not sure if I'm fully un understanding your question, but for me, yes, it, it it is about adding light to 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 add shape to something. If there's somebody outside, and like the shadow under their chin is jet black, then yes, adding a reflector is needed to do that. Um, or if they're standing next to water and there's too much light bouncing directly under their chin and they've lost all shape in their face, then I, I also need to take some of that light away so that we, we can add shape back to the face. Um, so I'm not sure if I've answered the question that you were after there, but... It's it's a question that I like to ask everybody because everybody has a very different... A different understanding or a different thought process about light and um, for me i i have a hard time when i go outside to try and take a portrait it just uh, you know looking for good light outside is difficult for me i i'm much it's much easier for me to go so into you're asking this. what good light is no not necessarily but uh, when when i'm when i'm outside looking around and uh, taking light i don't think of myself as 
lighting the scene. Um, I think of, you know, looking for available light and making the most of it. And it, it was just kind of a funny thing in my head. Like, what is lighting? What does that actually mean? What is what is lighting? So it's kind of a philosophical question, but um, it's interesting to just kind of to, to see how different people think about it. Um, the last last gentleman I was talking to, Gabe uh, Gabe Sachs, he does a lot of outdoor lighting, and he's just looking for open shade. And he's just it's really simple. You, you find your open shade, and it's beautiful. No problem. You know, job done. And um, yeah, you know, so yeah. it's it's just yeah. a, kind of an interesting thought process. And that how... is very difficult. That that light, that open shade or shadow light, as I mm. call it, is is extremely difficult to recreate in the studio. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's because it's borderline flat, and it's mm-hmm. very very difficult to create that collimated light, if you like, which is what which is what comes from the um, daylight itself, and then and to have that. I mean, but like suit, like it's just it's just a classic LA shot as well. They just take take some some girl behind a building and just like photograph her, and it's just like it's just gorgeous light. It's like, yeah. Right, yeah, you've yeah. you've done nothing, but yeah, cool. Though. It's a cool shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So it's it's just an interesting question. Uh, it was just a thought that went through my head as we as I got into talking to different people about it because I have my understanding of it, but just because it's my understanding doesn't mean that that's the same for everybody. So it's it's interesting. I think the psychological aspect that that you refer to there is is far deeper than people realize as well. I mean, just at its simplest form, right? We are used to seeing the human face under under a top light right we Mm. go outside and the sun is above us we go indoors there is lights on the roof so we are we are extremely accustomed to seeing the face being lit from above now when you start to break that rule and i and i I do and i do call it a rule when you start to break that rule then um like the viewer will will aggressively bounce off that 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 image so you know i think it's about you know how can we how can we use that knowledge or that psychological knowledge that you're referencing there to our to our advantage you know and like cinema will you know if it's if it's any good will will, will kind of do that and, and twist it so like they'll have like the bad guy sat at his desk and he'll have like a like a white plotter on his desk and the light will be bounced off it so that he's slightly being lit from below and it's really subtle right because mm-hmm. they're not actively lighting him from below but you'll see that the bad guy has this light coming from below or they'll seat him next to a fire or something like that and you can see that this 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 light is coming up from from below or there'll be a tv and that it'll be lit from so it's like subtle things like that but in in kind of we're not kicked out of that scene but our psychological mind is told that this is this is a bit off right this is this is this is not this is not this is not good this is not beautiful right mm. um so i think that you know great great cinematography does that really really well without kicking us out of the you know hammer horror you mm. know light them from below with a torch and it's just like that's obviously ridiculous but like great cinema that that can that can um control our psychological response to characters with with lighting i think is fascinating yeah it's, it's mm. incredible and that's i mean i'm not even getting into the color side of it yeah i just I wanted think, to say the whole color grading and the color yeah, like, thing is a whole yeah, other like, chapter yeah, too exactly like this like the semiotics of that based mm. on western culture to eastern culture it, mm. it's it's so many different rabbit holes that you can go into when you when you um, start to think about it, yeah. Yeah. So um, I reached out to you and asked about lighting and, you know, talking on the podcast, and you, your response was, oh, yeah, cool, I still like to shoot film. I shoot film on, you know, sometimes for myself and that sort of thing. And I was like, I didn't know that, so I thought, oh, that's perfect. That's even better. So uh, what, okay. Is, okay. What, is, um, what is the film uh, part of your process, or what what is it that draws you to it? Yeah, like I said, I mean, I you know when I was when I was learning, you know, twenty five years ago, and then something like that. It, it, you know, we we were all shooting shooting film back then, and I know it makes us sound like just archaic creatures, um, but but yeah, that was you know it was pretty pretty normal uh, back then. So I mean, it originally started off on you know thirty five mil, and then we you know art college we were shooting on medium format and that sort of thing, and. Um, you know, I, I, then the digital came around. I didn't, I didn't really, you know, I didn't, I didn't really touch it for years. And it, it wasn't until I don't know five or six, seven, maybe, maybe, maybe ten years ago that I started to, you know, dabble in it again. And I picked up um, a medium format film camera again. So I have the um, Pentax six by seven. Um, beautiful camera, you know, mm. absolutely incredible uh, images. And I think for me, one of the reasons I kind of 
sort of dip my toe back back into the film was what was was purely the larger um image format that, mm. that we get and the medium format depth of field and structure of an image that you get from that larger um film plane is is unparalleled i don't care i don't care how good your you know sony camera is um you know i, I only say that is because they'll they'll be the first to go on oh, mine's at 120 megapixels <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like i don't care how how many megapixels your chip has mm. like, it's not it's not about the megapixels it's the size of the chip yeah. and, and relation to the physics that the the light reacts with the lens going into that and the depth mm. of field you get is just unparalleled and you know you can go back to you know like vogue in the in the 90s or something like that and just look at some of the medium format black and white images in there and it's just incredible like the you just get sucked into those images and i'm just i, I just don't see that with um modern cameras anymore and, and and especially certain mirrorless cameras that can be very clinical right and and, and i totally get that um there's certainly a, a need for that but some of the some of the images created um, and, I, and I'm going to call out Sony again because this is this is not a detriment to them. This is obviously a plus. Like some people mm. could see this as Jake, you're saying it like like a negative, but it but it's a plus. And yeah, and if I was if I was shooting still life, hands down, I would buy a Sony tomorrow. Like no question. If I was shooting still life, food, whatever, um, you know, jewelry, you know, I, I it would be Sony mm. tomorrow. Um, but for me, when it comes to photographing people and portraits and that sort of thing, I, I just like a slightly more organic look to it that, that kind of draws me in. Um, so my day to day camera is a Nikon D850. Um, so it's still a DSLR and you know, like the lenses just, you know, like, <laughs> you know, there's sharp and then there's Nikon sharp, which is, <laughs> which is not sharp. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's sharp and then there's Sony sharp, which is, whoo you know the mm. other way but then we have you know nikon shot which is um which is definitely not uh but that's you know that, that, that there is there is this sort of organic nature to it and for me film is is, is going that extra layer deeper and and, and you know I, I kind of miss that um and it's you know and it's not film necessarily but it is the medium format like the far larger um film plane that that, that i just like portraits on that uh because you've got to remember that us portrait shooters, like we are used to exactly the same physical size of object, like a human, when it when it comes to that. And I just think that like something like the six by seven, you know, that I have when it comes to photographing like a headshot, just the depth and, and drop off that you have on that is just unrivaled by by anything, right? And it's not the fact, oh well, I'm going to shoot cars on that. You're not going to get the same. It's it's not the same depth of field when we're talking about photographing humans and mm -hmm. headshots. There is something about that, and people will talk about this kind of, you know, ethereal love and quality of like the the, the mystique and that sort of thing. But it but it is for for whatever reason, I think that that film size for me when it comes to those um, headshots is just sensational. Yeah, something about it that I just cannot get with digital. Hmm. So, um, do you, uh, do you enjoy using the, the, the six, seven more or less than your digital camera? Is it like the, is the tactile experience of using the camera different for you or is it all about the image? Uh, fair point. Yeah. I think it's, um, so I got up this morning and looked at the diary and I saw we had this, um, you know, podcast today and i was like oh you know made me think about it so i just put a post on instagram and i just shared some uh older images that i'd taken on a uh, mamiya universal press camera with a polaroid back and they're like the old i mean they're like the big you know mm. the, like the big prints the peel know, apart ones um, the peel apart ones yeah that cost you an arm and a leg now sadly but um and i was kind of just talking in the um comment of that post and i was just going like there is no getting a, there's no getting away from the fact that your brain engages with that shot very very differently to when you're shooting digital and you can try and pay attention when you're shooting digital of course you can yeah right? but your brain knows that mm. pff, no big deal just just yeah. take the bloody picture right <laughs> yeah you know but when you know like when i'm shooting on okay like the mamiya universal press peel apart is an extreme example but they're like eight ten pounds a shot mm. um you're paying attention yeah. Right. 
you are 100 percent pen attention you know i'm i'm counting down the shot like if you if you blink you, you and me are no longer friends right <laughs> um so you know you like you count it down you're thinking about everything it's like yeah you're thinking about the background i'm thinking about the depth i'm thinking about you know if everything's cut out your brain is 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 wired differently when you when you take that shot um and you can't re recreate that with digital so to your to your question about is it is it about that response? Yes, it is about like like the final image and, and the depth of that. And yes, it is a tool to to achieve that. But there is something that that sparks me when I use that um, camera, knowing that my brain is 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 fully engaged. You mm. know, um, and uh, yeah, and, and and as much as I would as, as I try and do that, you know, when I shoot digital, uh, I think it's a different discipline. It's like. I don't know. It's like painting or charcoal, right? It, it's you know you, you you kind of get into the same result, um, but it's it's a very very different um, medium, really. Yeah. Yeah, I I totally agree. I mean, I know when I when I'm taking digital images, I usually try to get things set up, do some do some digital images, and then I I you know put down my digital camera and I pick up whatever film camera I'm using that day, and and as you said, your brain just shifts and it's like okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're in the different mode now, and then when that I mean, especially with the six seven, when the shutter goes off, it's like you know you've taken a picture. <laughs> there yeah. is there is yeah. no mistaking that there's yeah. been a picture taken when that thing yeah. goes off. Well, you so, say that, but you see, like now, um, models, uh, you know, the the, the the I've worked with and encounters and, and been on shoots, and it's very difficult for for everybody on set because you have these mirrorless cameras that make mm, no noise. Yeah, and a lot of people are now shooting LED LED myself included so there's no flash that goes off yeah. so the poor model is like oh, i don't fucking i don't know what's going on yeah. is, can i move like what, yeah. what do you know so you know so yeah and then you go from that to the opposite just like <laughs> bum, 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 of the of the trap door being mm. slammed shut on the six seven yeah like every everybody in the building knows that you've taken a shot you know yeah. <laughs> so um so the, the, aside from the experience of using the equipment which i i love I, i've ever you know i'm work with my hands so i love i love the old cameras and stuff but but if we then look at the images and you know you've got your choices of film stock you mentioned earlier that you like to use kelvin as a as an artistic tool with your digital camera yes um yeah. you don't have that with film so are you picking a different film stock for a different look or how do you kind of play with that good question yeah good good question i uh, i I'm, I'm guilty of being super lazy lazy in that regard and i just know that the kelvin is going to need to be shifted front in the scan okay um so yeah you're right i you know um you know i could buy different you know film stock tungsten film whatever and do it do it like that uh, i'm yeah but I, i'm just i'm just lazy i know that i'm going to scan it and um i guess i you know i guess that kind of answers your previous question in, in kind of outing myself in what's what's important to me <laughs> it mm. is the final like you know like the final shot even though like the guys dev in the film or whatever must be like these are all bright orange idiot um, <laughs> <laughs> you know? um so uh yeah so i yeah i, I i'm not yeah and i'm i'm also guilty of just going oh L lomo film is cheap i'll just get that you know it, it is really the depth of the medium format that i'm after and people are like, oh you can't use that you know like it, it's renowned for the for the backing to stick to the film it's like, oh, i don't mind i don't mind those furry edges they're kind of mm. cool you know yeah adds character exactly yeah yeah so i am i, I yeah I'm, I'm i'm lazy yeah okay okay um so or I was going to go with something. Um, the 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 scanning. Do you do that yourself, or do you have somebody do it for you? I don't know. I just I just get them depth and scanned. Okay. Yeah, um, and then you you get a high res scan to work from. Exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, I've uh, I've kind of tested both myself and be like, you know, I, I know what I'm doing. I can do this. Um, and you know, I've I've sort of scanned them myself, and you know, <laughs> and I can get I can get you know i can get pretty 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 much there but it takes a long time to get like yeah. a decent scan unless you, you know if, if you're a, if you're a lab that's set up for it they're just buzzing them through and it's mm -hmm. job done you know like drop drum scan them or whatever it is and uh you know they, they come back amazing and you know I, I can do it do it myself here and i can be you know pretty pr pretty pretty damn happy with it um but the lab will get it like 95 percent of the way and that's for me is you know is kind of good enough um you know for what i'm doing for sure yeah and is um is it just part of uh is it just kind of something you do for fun or you do you incorporate it into your professional work as well 
purely personal yeah purely, okay. i mean in fact I, I don't even i don't i don't really share them um, okay yeah yeah I, it you know I, you even mentioned that today in instagram post it, uh, you know like you've just said there is i i, I say and that this is a personal passion of mine i, I never share them mm. um it's not something that i want to kind of offer or be asked for professionally it is it mm. is something that, that i kind of have a personal love for um you know and i don't know maybe it's it, like nostalgia is a weird word that i think is very difficult to define and maybe it's different for everybody or certainly different for every generation but i think as maybe a young photographer growing up in the 90s you know with the fashion magazines you know just before the internet killed magazines you know growing up with the you know like the vogues and the harpers and that sort of stuff and, and, and you know and being inspired by the work in there seeing you know like the supermodels being photographed on that medium format there it's, it's just it's just a very it's very very difficult to recreate that look other than just doing it you know and there's presets and all that sort of crap that you can get now but it, you know it's just it, it, it in my opinion it just doesn't doesn't come come close to it yeah 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 i i love the look of the film and uh, uh the experience of using it so it's it's really fun you know, it adds a whole nother element and do you do you find when you pull out your your film camera that the you get reactions from the models or anything like that like oh what is that and... yeah i mean yes yeah, so i mean that's yeah you, you gotta be careful right because if I'm, I'm photographing models and i'm gonna say oh i'm gonna do some some some, some film shots uh, i haven't signed a model release for film yeah that's right like, yeah <laughs> No, 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 no. It's like, yeah, no. Anal uh, how analog? Like, I mean, mm. what do you know? You just look like an idiot. Um, yeah. So, uh, so it's yeah. Getting the camera out is is. This is <laughs> this is weird, but I am getting older every day. But the people that I work with do not age, obviously, because it's just you know I've I've been working with eighteen to twenty one year old young ladies mm. forever. Like they're not getting any older. Mm. So what's so what's happening is that you you get your camera out and it's just like, what on earth is that? Mm. And it's you, you feel like four hundred. It's just like, what do you mean you don't know what this is? Like what what what, what is that? It's like it's it's really weird. It's such a bizarre concept to me to try and explain to a young person today what a film camera is mm. and, and i know it's like super obvious to us in our world and like that it, it's but if, if you if you honestly come across a young person who doesn't know what a film camera is and you try and explain it it's harder than you think <laughs> right yeah. it, it's because like this i'm taking an image that is on film what do you mean it's not but it's not video what do you mean it's on film it's on a thing that i have to send away that i will then get back so so i can't see them yeah. jesus christ this is weird like this is bizarre. why why like, would you why do that are you doing that yeah, yeah it, it, it's i know it seems bizarre but like honestly there are there are young people today who have no idea what a film camera is and you there isn't even anything kind of close to approximate that knowledge to mm. to them i mean even young people knows know what lps are now mm. like young people know what lps are but there are certainly young people who you know I, i've done several shoots with young girls and it's just no clue mm. what a film camera is and like there's no reason why they would no there isn't like because if film is it, you know or like you know camera and imagery is, is just everywhere it's just instantaneous for them and, yeah. and, and anything beyond that it is just just alien it's just super alien yeah yeah i mean they grew up with, grew up with uh, smartphones so even even a big it, slr is is foreign in to them yeah. yeah yeah i guess yeah. i guess instex is probably the most um popular or well-known kind of analog yes. media i suppose but i mean i still think that's that i mean you, yeah I, I guess I, but i still think you'd struggle to find young people now i i, I know we're, we're used to it but yeah honestly it, it mm. is it's um I mean that, and that gap is only going to get weirder, right? Mm. Like it's only going to get more bizarre trying to trying to explain it. Explain yeah. it, yeah. yeah. I, I know I had a very very clear memory in my mind. I was working with a model, and I was I was joking around. And I said like, "Oh, I feel like Austin Powers doing the photo shoot here." She's like, yeah. "Austin, who? Who? What's that?" And yeah. I was like, "Oh, what? crap." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's, I'm out it's, myself. It's bizarre. Yeah, mm. it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Funny. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up one of your one or two images here, and uh, let me see my technology working here. So one of the things that I was noticing um, 
if I do that and I do that, uh, nope. Hang on. Stand by. There we go. Okay. And now I have to click that button. All right. So we've got we've got two images here. <coughs> Sorry. So if I'm if I'm uh, looking at the images correctly, we've got we've got an image on the right, which is a portrait of a, a kind of a head and shoulders portrait, a lady looking off to the left, and um, it's all a bit a bit bluish, as you say. And then on the other side, we've got a more or less full body. She is sitting on a stool, looking to the right, and uh, the colors are very similar. And your your style. Um, and I think the reason that we can't tell them apart is because I think I've pulled up two analog images. Um, right. yeah. I wanted to pull up one of the digital ones to compare oh, it to. That was, my, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. that was my goal. There we go. Gotcha. All okay. right, now I've got, now I've got the, okay. the analog and the digital one coming up to each other, yeah, next yeah, yeah. to each other, yeah. um, which still look very similar in the, in the look and feel of the image. Um, so, so how do you, how do you achieve that? I mean, where, what what is the the baseline that you you move to or bringing them so together again it's you know again it's the lighting mm -hmm. here so yes yes we are outside in in daylight but i'm really using the daylight as a fill light here so mm -hmm. we're so we're under like a sort of a canopy here and, and the sun is, is is about to go down kind of behind us and we've got this this kind of hand painted backdrop behind her and then what i've got is i've got a large um LED panel off to camera right here, and that's 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 all that's pushed all the way to tungsten, right? Mm. So that's as warm as it will go. Um, and then the same on her left. I have a hair light up nice and high um, to the left, and and again that's that's pushed all the way to um, tungsten, so it's nice and warm. And then what's 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 happening is you know philistine that I am, I'm, I'm shooting that on the film camera so that that will be orange mm. in the um, film camera. But then in um, post, I'm, I'm then bringing that that Kelvin back down so that we, so that we're left with this kind of bluish bluish greeny um, hue to the skin. And you can see it in some of the shadows and stuff on her collarbones on the film image on the right. You see how the shadows and stuff are kind of going that sort of bluish hue because of that because of that heavy shift in Kelvin adjustment afterwards so the orange tungsten lights are then being counterbalanced by my kelvin shift and then some of that fill light is is then appearing kind of bluish so to me that's 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 really one of the main factors as to why those two images are looking the same is because the lighting was the same yeah mm. and then the, yeah and, and then and then the post was you know similar with, with, with regards to the like the kelvin that i'm after so would you would you kind of um, you know do your post processing on your digital image first and then adjust your film shot to match that? Um, I, 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 like a shot like this, I've got a very clear kind of look as to how I know it's going to look beforehand when I'm shooting it. So yes, I guess you could say that the uh, I mean the the digital image I'm I'm correcting in camera, right? Mm. So I'm shooting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting my Kelvin in camera on on the day, as it were. So really, it just it just comes to when it when it comes to the the, the film one. When I get the scan back, I'm I'm just adjusting that um, Kelvin of the of the uh, film one to kind of be similar to match the digital one. I mean, they, they don't they don't always match, you know, because certain films you know have 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 different you know tones and that that sort of thing anyway but yeah for you know for the most part as long as the lighting is the same you should get you should in, in a controlled environment you should get a similar look to film and digital hmm. so what what are the what are the things that you find are are different in the use of the some films are different in how they how they react so what would would be an example of that yeah well i mean you know like portra you know is the you know is the go to for a for a lot of people and then lomo is going to be something different and then you've got the i forget the one that everybody uses out, outside with the neon lights and the uh, the sinistil sinistil thank you mm. i've got a role here that i've never never plucked up the courage to use um but yeah so that they're all going to have a certain a, a certain look to it but for me i will say that i'm doing i'm doing color shifts in 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 post to, mm. to kind of match my um sort of style anyway so that that's why if, if there's a cheap film on sale i'll, I'll get it i'm not i'm not like oh i need the portrait one 160 look mm. like that's that's the that's the you know I, I need those kind of 
green highlights in the skin or something like that from from something like that. so i'm not as swayed by the film stock as somebody else because i am doing um a little bit of post to my images afterwards okay. I know everybody's everybody's probably just clicked off the podcast now but <laughs> no no I, heretic I, burn I, him <laughs> no i i do a fair amount of uh, of post processing on my film images as well yeah. and um it's you know everybody goes for the the film look and a lot of people talk about the the colors of the film yeah fair, and fair. so that yeah. was that was part of my question is like um when when I scan my film, uh, another podcast that came up with a great a great phrase. It's the um, the Scannenberg uncertainty principle, which is you scan a film okay. and yeah. then you invert it and then you go, "What the hell are these colors supposed to look like? I have no <laughs> yeah, clue." Because yeah. yeah. you know you can just make them look whatever you you know however you want them to look like. Which is my solution is I adjust it until I like it. But you know, there's this there's this um, feeling of like, well, what are the are the true colors of this oh, portrait? Absolutely, yeah. You've got to be careful. Yeah, you've got to yeah. be careful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but yeah, so I I am you know similar to you. I'm I'm going for a look that that is uh, you know that, that I'm after. But in terms of retouching, I don't do uh, you know barely any retouching mm-hmm. to the actual subject. I mean, even if there's like bits of hair or dust on the scan or something like that I will kind of leave it and this is this is I don't know whether you've encountered this or whether it's a question that you're going to ask but this is something that fascinates me that okay years ago we would we would be really adamant about trying to show off that we were shooting film right mm. I mean even even when, even when I was in the dark room years ago mm. we would we would include the the, the film edge right okay. because you're because you're trying to prove yeah. That you shot this on film, right? You're a mm. real photographer, okay. so you're really trying to, you know, show off that you that you've done that. Um, and I do find myself like leaving in dust and hair and that sort of stuff, and uh, for that reason. And you, you see here, I've got the like the, the film border as well. You know, I've mm. left that in to show that I'm a real photographer. You know, mm. and um, it is something that I think some people try and try and do and and, and prove that that's the case. And we're seeing it now with AI, right? Mm. You know, like how like what what do you just do hashtag not ai i mean because mm. it feels like that's what we have to do now mm. um so i think that we're going to be going through a similar sort of thing that we went through with film where we have and, and i know there are people who, who are listening that may maybe don't think that they're old but the they're going to be in a situation now where they're going to want to try and be adamant that they want to tell people that this is a real photograph now this is what we went through years ago with film we were trying to you know show off to everybody that we were doing this on film and we're doing the same thing again now where we don't want people to think it's an ai image Mm -hmm. so we're going to have to try and you know make it look like how much imperfections do we leave in Mm -hmm. you know how you know how scuffed do we make it look so that it doesn't look this you know clinical ai shot anymore um because it's difficult like you know i it's I, I had a friend once who was working for a, for a major fashion label. Um, and I was like, man, that's a cool gig, you know, fair play. He's like, yeah, yeah it is. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, cool. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, we're in the studio, but I kind of have to make my images look a bit scuffed so that people feel like it's real, you know? It's like, I mean, you know, I have to leave a light stand in shot or like there has to be footprints on the backdrop or like the backdrop has to be a little bit ripped, you know, to try and, you know, because the Instagram generation years ago, it was like, it has to feel like organic and like this is real. This has happened on the day. Like you are part of the scene, you know? Um, and you, so we were kind of, you know, like we, we do go through these these phases of trying to prove that, that we are still the, we are still a true artist, you know. We haven't mm. just we haven't just typed in six prompts and hit enter, job done. Um, those people who think that that they're an artist for doing that are ludicrous. Um, but you know, I, I do think that we are going to go through that pr- process again of trying to prove that these are real images. Oh, it's it's going to be a whole nother a whole nother uh, adventure and learning curve and shift in paradigm. You know, uh, yeah, going through I mean, going through all those things. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be I mean and we're still at the birth of it like you know oh, yeah. AI is never going to be as bad as it as it is today right? it's going to be better <laughs> yeah. tomorrow like yeah. that's the reality of it and, and and the fact that it's getting more and more precise and accurate I mean I would consider myself as f- reasonably skilled and I would consider myself that you know 6 months ago I could have easily 
easily spotted an AI image. I, I, I honestly cannot put my hand on my heart and say the same thing today. That's, mm. that's the truth of it. Um, so for the majority of people, like 99% of people, they're just going to skim past uh, an image and, you know, it's, it's, it's not, they're just going to assume it's, assume, you know, just assume that it's either AI or a photo. It's just going to be, yeah, it's just going to be AI. Um, I have seen a rise in my long exposure imagery, maybe as a pushback to this, you know, clinical um, AI shots that we're seeing, and I wonder if we will see more of a more of a rise in analog shots as mm. well, because of the you know because of this anti AI look that many people are kind of pushing for. So uh, you know, more we'll hairs, more hairs and dust on on the image, the better. Really, mm. is, is basically where, where we're at. We're gonna start sprinkling dust on. The I mean, <laughs> I'll sell you a pack. I'll sell oh, you a yeah. pack of digital oh, yeah. dust. Right? Just leave it with me. I'll do you a deal. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Real dust. It'll be the next new yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned you mentioned your long exposure photography, um, which which I've played around with a bit. But you do some some really cool different kind of techniques with the the long exposure. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up another image here uh, that that kind of even though I've played with it a bit, it still confuses me how how this happens. Because you've got you've got a, a model that's you know kind of a it's not a white background it's a gradient from a very light gray to a darker greener gray up at the top and then you've got kind of a blue a blue tummy I guess area and um, and then she's got her arms up over her head and her her face is clear her body's clear but you can see a lot of movement in her hair and her arms and it almost mm. looks like three exposures. Um, but I'm I'm just curious how that how that happened. Yeah, I, yeah, it, it is just a mix of. I mean, this this shot is very very very, very old now, but it, that's that's a mixture of uh, tungsten, which has been uh, had a CTB or color temperature mm -hmm. blue gel applied to that tungsten light to, to to bring it to the same color temperature as the flash. So yeah, so the um, background it, you know has a tungsten light on it, and then she is is being flashed. So, uh, you know, I think long exposure is a fascinating technique to me. And, and I think it always, you know, if, if done well, I think that, that, it, that, it, that it's always very popular when, when people view it as well. And I think that it's one of the very few disciplines or techniques that we have as photographers that is utterly unique to us. Mm. Um, and when I say unique, I mean, like you can't capture it on video and mm. you can't capture it with your human eye. Right. So this is one of the only disciplines that, that is I kind of got a bit of that mystique, bit of that black magic that we used to have 20 years ago, you know, as film shooters, like clients would be really interested in what you're doing. Like, oh, OK, mm. that's cool. Yeah, I got a film camera. Oh, I see what you do. Like now clients don't give a shit. They're like, oh, I got an app that does that. It's cool. Yeah, whatever. You know, like whereas long exposure has definitely got a bit of that black magic to it when people see it like, what? What's going mm. on there? Makes that's it look twice. Yeah, yeah, and especially if they're there on the day, like a mm. client is abs a client's absolutely blown away by long exposure, man. Mm. They're just, minds are just blown because it doesn't exist in front of them, right? Yeah. It just doesn't exist. Um, so, and, yeah, and, and then you are able to, you know, transfer it into a still image. It, it, it is, it, you know, always, always gets a lot of attention. And I do um, a lot of long exposure workshops and that is the one, and I, I do several different types of um, in, in person lighting workshops, but the long exposure workshop is the, the one workshop that gets the oohs and ahs from mm. people taking images, right? Because they're like, you know, people, students are just totally fascinated by it. Just like, you know, get really engrossed in it and they're just constantly looking at the image going, you know, because every single image is totally unique. You know, you can try and get it perfect and exactly, you know, replicate it, but you can't. It's just, it's just too many variables in it. So, um, yeah, I've, I've certainly got a um, soft spot for long exposure. And then trying to do it with portraits is another layer of complexity. But, yeah, it, it, it is a lot of fun and, and is always eye-catching, yeah. Yeah, that's cool, and I I like um you know you've got you've got different images you know some um, I'll pull up another one here where it's very obvious you know this is clearly mm. a you know yeah. big big streaks of color kind of uh, shifting through here, but then you've got you got other ones like the one that I just pulled up before where it's it's a bit more subtle it's just a little bit of movement here or there and it it just makes you or it makes me anyways just go stop and and look at it and go 
It's cool, yeah, man. absolutely. That's love interesting. that technique. Yeah, I love that technique. Yeah. 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 You've got um you know, I encourage people to go and check out your website and we'll we'll share all that at the end. But uh you've got your your kind of different you've got your projection stuff that you do, you've got your mm. uh long exposure and then um you know, just color in general is, is always a part of your, a part of your, uh, images and, um, it really, really delicate, um, like the gradient in the background here is just fascinating how you've got this really subtle, it's, it's from a light pink to kind of a nice minty green, um, you know, just this really, really beautiful shift of color going through it. And, um, no, I, yeah, I love. Cool, that one, yeah. I love in your images that the color is never distracting; it's always adding to the image. Yeah. Interesting, yeah, yeah. I think it's yeah. I think it's a fine line to to yeah to try and do that. Um, I'm I'm definitely guilty of, uh, you know, trying to make my work stand out. Right? Mm. You know, no offense to people, but anybody like my mum can take a decent picture of a pretty girl, right? Mm. Um, it that, it really isn't difficult, right? Regardless of what Instagram t- try to tell you every day, it is not hard to take a picture of a pretty girl. So, how can I try and you know add my my stamp on the image? So I am kind of almost fighting against the um, pretty girl to a certain extent. How can I try and make my my kind of uh, art, if you like, stand out above the you know uh, incredible looks of this? young lady and obviously if you you know if if both of you are doing your job properly then that's you know that that's when you start to create some um great 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 images right where you have this interest of you know color and light and then and on top of that you have a great great subject then you know it's win-win yeah yeah and that's that's part of the reason why i like using film is also to you know do something a bit different and you know try and maybe maybe make get some attention or or do something that is least fun for me and is not quite the norm or yeah you know, yeah they yeah. uh some people say that you know film photographers uh try and uh, try and make it as difficult as possible to get a good image yeah. you know, the people the people who are doing like wet pick wet plate collodion and large format and all of these crazy things you know or cyanotype portraits or all these all these crazy techniques that people do it's like let's see how difficult we can make it to take a picture yeah i guess so yeah i guess so but and there's it's just it's just so, so unique looking right mm. um you know i i think that you know i kind of mentioned this before but we, we, you know us as a society are certainly in a state at the moment where we're just image blind mm. you know, we can we can just skim through just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images and you know, you put your phone down and like, can you tell me one image that you just saw? Mm. You know, can you explain? He, he can't really. They're just all, you know, all the same. So I think, you know, I think us as creators, I think if we can um, maybe try and engage ourselves, like take the onus on ourselves to try and engage with what we're viewing, right? You know, if we if, if we are skimming through images, if there is an image that makes us stop and look, for a fraction of a second longer, you know, try and engage your brain and, and try and go, why am I looking at this image more than more than something else, right? And sure, if it's a, you know, if, if it's a wet plate, then as you say, I mean, yeah, if, if I'm skimming through images and I see a wet plate, I, you, be, you better better believe I'm bloody stopping at looking at that, you know, because it's like, wow, look at this, you know, look at the, look at the depth of field on that. Was it, mm. you know, F 0.2 or something that, you know, like what is the, you know, like, wow, that's incredible. You know, look at how it deals with the highlights on skin, you know, that I'm, I'm just, you know, fascinated by, you know, by that. So yeah, you know, anything to, to me that is, that is going to, that is going to um, grab my attention for a fraction of a second longer. I, I try and cognitively go, okay, what is it that I'm drawn to here? Um, you know, and, hopefully you can take some element of that and put that into your own work right hmm. and how how do you um if you see something that you that gets your attention and, and catches your eye um how do you try and digest that and and incorporate it into your into your toolkit or whatever that is yeah this is something that i i'm still working through um as I'm sure we all are, but uh, I think I think humans are inherently creative. You know, I I think that as children we all create, um, 
which is which is kind of bizarre to me because we'll you know we'll we'll happily paint and draw you know until the cows come home, um, you know for hours on end. And there's something along the line there. There's something that happens to us where we stop doing that, right? Most of us, many of us, at least, stop doing that. Um, my point being here is that I think that we are all inherently creative, uh, and, and I think that we are all inherently drawn to the idea of creating um, something, you know, new that that, that wasn't there before. Um, so when I'm seeing kind of you know images buzzing past me and that sort of thing and I, like I just said to you I'm trying to engage with them and, and try and take on board what made me stop and look at it um, was it the color combination right is it is it the fact that 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 blue stands out more than the pink is that um, a dominant color is it a recessive color is it the pose is it a really dynamic angled pose am I looking at flowing lines through that image has it caught my attention because of the composition of that is it a low angle am I am I looking at that image because it's been shot down low with a wide angle lens and that's you know that's kind of unique perspective on the human body that i've never seen before is it the the um you know colors in the background is it is it the lens choice you know i'm really i'm really trying to break down all these elements and then uh you know i think over time whether it be walking a dog or whatever my brain will kind of digest this and spit out a few of them that is you know, okay, how can I incorporate a low wide angle type of shot into my next into my next image, right? And then I try and sort of engineer my my work with that with that kind of baseline in mind. Okay, how can I do that kind of setup like what I would normally do my gel lighting setup, but how can I try and do it with a low angle and a wide angle? And I think that this is this is really all it is. You know, I I think we can we're in we're in this state now where we just take on so much data and so much information and so much knowledge just instantly. We just watch like ten YouTube videos and we're, and we're like we're professionals. Like that's cool, but like there is there there is a process to it, and I think you, like you can't learn everything at once. You can't implement everything at once. So like for me, it, it is. I'm just going to implement you know uh, small changes and differences in in my work shoot to shoot, uh, and I always try and do at least one brand new setup even if it's a quick one short one or at least technique style type look um every time i shoot now it's not always possible because of time but i really try and force myself to do it uh because something may may come out of that that i can then grow and develop it's not going to be a banger right out of the tube you know it's not going to just be like you nailed it mm -hmm. wide angle low angle that's the perfect new, just absolutely put the j kick stamp on that mm. ship it like it's be like okay yeah that works but we're gonna need to think about you know the studio she like with that wide angle now I'm starting to see the curtains you know in the studio like how mm. can I how can I shift this perspective to try and make this work and improve it and adapt it in the future so I think I understand the question that you're getting at here with inspiration like how do you take inspiration and turn it into your actual work and mm. and, and for me I think it is it, it, it's it, it's a slow process just put it in the put it in, in the memory banks and then try and implement it next time you know but you can't do everything at once right i know i know youtube tells you you can but you just just do it just do it slowly yeah well there's you know the the 10,000 hours or whatever it is you just got to i honestly don't think there's a shortcut to that yeah. like you can you can get you can get good within 10 hours but from there like those the rest of those 9,000 hours man that's 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 the tough slog man mm. that's the tough slog i mean cuz cameras do most of the work for you now yeah. like that's that's not that's not beat around the bush mm. you know it really can um you know led lighting and what you mm. see is what you get like you, you you've got you know what a sony evf viewfinder with you know that's got the bloody starship Ent enterprise packed into the into that little <laughs> thing you know you've got the evf showing you exactly what the led lighting and mm. all the colors are looking like you trying to tell me you can't take a good picture get out of here mm. come on man you got no excuses <laughs> like it's just no excuses yeah yeah it's not it's so the only thing that you know that you can do now is just to be creative with it you know what mm. can i what can I do to add add my own twist to it? You know, my my own sort of uh, uh, little little signature to it. And then this is this is something that I get asked a lot. Oh, Jake, you know, you're you know you're famous for this you know s this style that you've got this colored you know lighting that sort of thing. Like, you know, how did you get your photographic style? It's it's like a photographic style is in is in every single one of us. Like, you, we cannot mm. escape it. It's not something that is handed to you when you leave art college, right? You're the HDR guy. Oh, you know, you're doing black and white. Like, it doesn't work like that. Like, it's it's in all of us, whether you like it or not. You know, and it's 
you know, I get people going, oh, well, God, Jake, you must be you must be so bored like having to shoot the same thing over and over again. I don't have to shoot the same thing over and over again. <laughs> That's not how this works, mm-hmm. right? I do it because I'm super passionate, but I, I'm drawn to this, this type of thing. Now, when I say like a photographic style is in all of us, I mean that... Like I've just said to you, right, we're going through images and I'm drawn to maybe a low angle, wide angle. Let's, let's keep it simple, right? Now, that's just one image. Okay, well, let's let's keep looking at images. Let's keep looking at images. And when I was in the studio and um, managing the studio, I would get young kids coming in. They just they just finished, you know, college or whatever, raring to go, get me in the studio, Jake, you know, l- let me at them. And I'd be like, you know, just before we do that, I just want you to have like an idea of what you want to achieve and how we're trying to achieve it. So I would get them to kind of, um, first of all, I'd get them to sit down and I would go, look, can you just, just write down five things that you think make the perfect photograph? Mm. You know, if you just, just write them down and, you know, young people, whatever, you know, just, just finished uni college, whatever. And, and you know, and for the most part, it's going to be correctly exposed, you know, uh, white balanced, uh, rule of thirds, you know, um, in, in focus. focus. Exactly, right? Mm. You get it. I, I yeah. t- totally get it, right? You're right. Like, okay, yeah, cool. Mm. All right, let's take that list. Let's put it to, to, mm. to a side. I just, want you to, I just want you to go away for me and just spend an hour and just go through the internet and just bring me 20 images that you think are the greatest 20 photographs that humanity has ever created. And I want you to bring me those 20 images and I want to see them afterwards. Okay, so they'd go off and they'd collect these 20 images um, and, they, and they'd bring them back. I go, wow, Whew, these, these are some incredible photographs. Um, let's look at this list you just made here. Like When you look at these images, like the first thing you think is, wow, that's in focus. Mm-hmm. You know, or oh, the white balance on that is spot on. Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not, it's bullshit. <laughs> like none of that shit matters when it, when, it, when it comes to the actual image. What is important is the elements surrounding that, that, that make up that image. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I get them to look at those images and go, you know, look, you've, you've got these images here and I'm seeing a lot of like colorful shots, maybe, and, and, the, and the model's got a lot of dynamic poses. And actually some of these shots are taken on a slightly wider lens, mm-hmm. right? This is our personal style, right? We may not realize it yet, but that's your personal style, what you're drawn to, yeah? Because these images have already been taken before. You're just kind of drawn to those types of shots. So I go, look, let, let's take those elements and let's just try and actively put them into your future work, right? So this this slightly wide angle, you 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 you're loving this pink and blue color scheme, uh, and you're loving dynamic poses, right? Let's make sure that in our next photo shoot that you are putting those three things in there, because guess what? If you start to put in elements of other images that you love in your own work, you're going to start to love your own work, right? Mm-hmm. That's your personal style. Now, like I said, that is a kind of a like, like like a kind of a hack to kind of you know eke it out of young people like early on, rather than just doing what I did, which was bang my head against the wall for twenty years. Uh, like we can kind of weed it out. Now that may change in the future, and you can do that same exercise in six months or a year's time, but you know that's your inherent personal style is what you love in other people's work we just need to kind of be more cognizant of getting it out there rather than just looking at some random lighting diagram and going yeah let's do that Mm. (laughs) does does that speak to you or are you just Mm. doing it because that's what this latest website has just has just put out let's get out the tape measure and the light meter and make sure we match that exactly yeah yeah. i I used i I used to work with a company that used to do like school portraits and that sort Mm. of thing and they were send their photographers out this is no word of a lie they would send their photographers out with this um string with knots in it right so at the tripod would mm. be the, the, this this knot on the string and then it would okay. be to a light which mm. would be where the other knot was and then okay. there would be a light where the other knot was uh, no word of a lie right yeah. this is like you know like what are we doing here mm. you know it's just crazy i mean we take the piss out of ai now but god <laughs> i mean that's basically what it was yeah yeah Wow. Well, the the whole the whole discussion of style is great. I I heard um, uh, another photographer his advice was you know when you when you find pictures that you like, um, you know make a folder of them. Just throw the throw the, the pictures in a folder. But what I thought was interesting was then start adding your own pictures into the folder too, and okay. see if they fit with the pictures that you like. You know, and then, you know, maybe you'll you'll see some that you don't like. And so you get rid of those from your folder. And as you keep working, then you might think, OK, yeah, you know, my my images are, you know, kind of starting to fit in better with these, you know, images that I like. I thought it was kind of an interesting way of way of looking at it, you know. 
Yeah, I mean, it's similar to what I just said. We'd just be yeah. a, bit, a bit more yeah. tactical with it mm. in, in, in cutting out like like the middleman rather than just hoping our images look like it. We need to, sure. we need to look at the like the elements of the images and try and implement them. Yeah. 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 Well, that, um, that kind of ties in um, when somebody is starting. Uh, maybe they've been, you know, taking pictures on the street or landscapes or I, I always... I'm, always digging on landscape photographers it's great it's just not my thing i i look i, I start i shot taking landscapes as well when i was yeah. younger yeah that's what i was doing yeah. um so um and somebody who wants to then start taking pictures of people doing portraits doing some studio lighting um what would what would be a a good starting point for them the classic question uh mm. so they've got their camera they've, they've got a they've, camera maybe yeah. they've got a light yeah yeah. Okay. They've got a light. Okay. Um, so this is not about what kit they need to buy next. No, it's about no, definitely they, not. Okay. 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 I mean, like I said, try and, try and, try and think about, uh, you know, the elements I mentioned earlier on about, you know, trying to make them a 3d, you know, th make them have this shape and form. And so if, you, if you've got one light, you know, maybe bring that subject a little bit closer to the background. So that light, falls off onto the background so we have that separation in the shot yeah don't just isolate them in this in this vacuum of space where it's just jet black behind them you know maybe bring them closer to the back wall let that light fall onto the background um you know always make sure that light is above eye level right you know have it above the, the eye make sure that that light is falling down on them that's how we're used to seeing one another's faces so, so let, let, let's make sure that we're doing that um and you know if you're if, if you're just starting out and you want like a hard and fast rule is just point the point the nose to the light right that's mm. always going to give you this this flattering um light it's always going to be beautiful looking light uh you know don't don't have them you know we're looking away and you have this ugly nose shadow that's cast across there yeah i know the internet tells you that's loop lighting but that's shit lighting yeah <laughs> that you can't just you can't just you can't just put a light somewhere and then just give it a name and it's like yeah no, I, I intended to do that like mm. No, <laughs> either join those <laughs> shadows up or, or keep them separate. Yeah. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, so where should people go to, to find your, your work and, and get in touch with you? You, you do, um, in-person workshops you mentioned, you also do, I think, um, some online workshops and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. So everything's at my website. Oh, there you go. Jkxphotography.com. Yeah. And then, uh, all, you're, uh, you're Jake Hicks photography everywhere, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, keeps which, it nice and makes easy. It, makes it easy for, for, for me to remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but I do in-person workshops, uh, you know, here uh, around London, and then uh, I do a lot of online training with people, yeah, all, all, all over the world, um, mainly Americans at the moment, for, <laughs> for, for whatever reason. Um, I suppose yeah. that's the, the only economy that's, that's doing well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, so yeah, so a lot of online um, workshops with them and uh, training, whether it be business or, um, you know, portfolio feedback and that sort of thing. So, yeah, but everything's on there. So, yeah, just head to my website, jkphotography.com, and uh, yeah, have a look. But there's, there's also tons of just hundreds of free articles on there as well. I've been doing a um, series called Technique Tuesday for nearly 10 years. So there is hundreds of free articles on there, including loads of um, lighting techniques to, you know, with lighting diagrams and stuff to play play with. If you want to, you know, dip your foot into using colored lights, um, there's loads of free articles on there that you can uh, have a look at and um, play with. So yeah, give it, give it a shot. Yeah, and I I, um, I found it years ago and I just went back and opened it up. You, you have like this lighting book that you do um understanding light or something it's called and it's it's like a pdf right. book and uh, i i read through it the past couple of days and it's it's just fantastic you know to kind of get an idea of you know what to look for what light is doing and uh good good yeah, yeah. I, I i found it really really a great resource just to kind of go back good. and look through all those things good. i mean so, and that's free all you have to do is yeah. give me your email address and that i will definitely won't won't pester you yeah. um but <laughs> yeah yeah. So yeah, but you're right. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, that that is something that yeah you can everybody can get hold of you know for free. They just um, sign up to the newsletter and yeah that they can grab it. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, anything you want to add? Anything we haven't covered that you think would be would be relevant or? No, uh, I think I ranted off topic long enough. I don't think I need to. Uh, yeah. Well, I think I think that's the the key ingredient of any good podcast is some several off topic rants. So. 
yeah 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 i'm always i'm always really cautious of it because I, I you know i think people love the art but they don't want to meet the artist right so i'm always <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm pretty passionate about what i do but I've, sometimes i have to try and rein it in that it's like yeah not not everybody is is is, is quite there yet jake you know like <laughs> you're passionate about what you do but yeah yeah uh, do you consider yourself an artist uh yes yeah i do yeah yeah in fact okay. i probably prefer to be called that over a photographer these days yeah. okay yeah yeah that's that's interesting i have i have a hard time uh, also in my work you know people call me an artist as a as a jeweler and i think mm, i don't know am i am i an artist maybe maybe not but oh yeah absolutely yeah. I mean, you're creating something right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. That's a, maybe that's a whole other philosophical discussion of what makes an artist and what is a you know oh else, yeah i mean but... that's yeah what with the the ai situation right at the moment is uh, ripe yeah. it's ripe for the picking that yeah. is true yeah 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 because they are not artists yeah no all right well before we go down that <laughs> rabbit hole i think we should wrap things up here otherwise we're going to be here all night <laughs> yeah. yeah thank you for having me yeah it's been wonderful having you on thanks for coming i'm, I'm really glad we were able to do this and uh for all you guys listening, go and uh, check out Jake's website and his, his images. They're really cool. And uh, we'll be back uh, in a couple weeks with the next episode, whatever that'll be. So thanks, everybody, and have a good one. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.